thank you for the nice introduction and thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it. I know there are lots of other things you could be doing, but you decided to come and spend your evening with me. I will, I hope, not talk too long. I was informed that I'm only supposed to talk for about 20 minutes. Now that's, that's <laughs> tough. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to confine myself to that. But I will try. I'm going to sort of explain why I wrote this book and what I hope to accomplish in the book. And this is by way of a preface, which I didn't write in the book. And I usually don't write prefaces in the book, at least prefaces that explain why the author did what he did. I usually find that stuff as a reader kind of boring because I don't really care why the author wrote what he did. I just want to read what the author has to say. But, and the other reason that I don't write prefaces these days is mostly they would say the same thing. The reason I wrote this book is for money. <laughs> and Samuel Johnson once said that none but a blockhead would ever write except for money. And so there is a long and honored tradition of writing for money. Um, you know, that's, that's part of the reason. I, I suppose if I if nobody bought any of my books, by now I would have given up and I wouldn't be writing. Now, people do buy some of my books and so I keep writing. But I wrote, actually, I wrote this book, this book because a publisher asked me to write it and said that I, we think that a, an interpretive history of the United States since 1945 would be interesting and would find a ready market. And I was willing to be persuaded and also because I've long decided that I'm never going to write a memoir. I'm not going to share my private life with the rest of the world. But this is almost the equivalent, or it's the historian's substitute for a memoir, because the period of this book, the United States since 1945, is not exactly the period of my life. I was born in 1953, but it is a period through most of which I have lived. And this is, this poses some particular opportunities for the historian and particular challenges. Now, first, all, well, the opportunities, I guess, are maybe fairly obvious. There is all this stuff out there, all this stuff that has happened during the course of my life and from the looks of you during the course of many of your lives that, what shall I say, needs to be interpreted uh, that puts it too strongly. It doesn't need to be interpreted, but maybe somebody would like to have it interpreted. Somebody would like to tell the story of our generation. And if somebody suggests, a publisher, for example, suggests to me, are there any more chairs? Any more chairs around there, or back there? That won't make you stand, Mary, but... Okay. Um, you know, if I get the opportunity to try to impose some order or some interpretation on events of the last 65 years, then I'm willing to give it a shot. The biggest challenge behind, the biggest challenge involved in something like this is figuring out what's important. For some while, I teach at the University of Texas, and every year I teach an introductory survey class. And one of the exercises I give to my 300 students is to go read newspapers. The introductory survey at UT, as in most universities, is broken into two halves. There's the first half that goes up to the Civil War, the end of the Civil War. The second half carries the story forward from there. And when I'm teaching the second half of the survey, I teach, I alternate each year. When I teach the second half of the survey, I have the students read newspapers for the week they were born. Now, I started doing this when the students were born in the 1960s. Well, now, the students, when they do this, the students they're into the first Bush administration or the Clinton administration. <laughs> and so <laughs> I can sort of track, what shall I say, my aging process. In <laughs> fact, I just, uh, John, where are you? The, counted the parent of a student that I taught who is about to turn 40 years old, or just did. Um, anyway, so this exercise that I pose to my students has a couple of purposes. One is, to make them realize that they can be their own historian. There is this tendency, I've observed it in my students and in some of my readers, to think that if something makes it into a history book, that it's the equivalent of being handed down from on high. 
And I'm still intrigued when readers express shock at discovering something I got wrong in one of my books. You know, well, I made these books, and there's something wrong in every one of them. I try to get it all right, but there's just lots of stuff that goes in. But the larger point here is that people write history books. And my history students think that these people, they often think that these people are a breed apart. But in fact, if you want to write history, all you have to do is go look at the source materials and see what sense you can make of it. So the students go read a week's worth of newspapers, and then I, ha I have them write up a newsletter, the equivalent of a Newsweek or a Time magazine for that week, and explain what was important. Now, I ask them to keep in mind two competing principles. One is I want them to identify things that were important at that time or seemed important at that time that turned out not to be important. Now, how do we know or how do we decide that they turned out not to be important? What I do is I tell them, find me stuff that got big coverage in the press that week but doesn't show up in history books. And they can use the textbook that we're using or they can use some other book. But if they're reading about the late 1980s, find me something that seemed like a big deal in 1987. But when you pick up a history of 1987 written 20 years later, that it's not there. Okay? Now, you might not be surprised to know that that's the easy part of the exercise. Because a lot of stuff that seems like a big deal today turns out not to be such a big deal. The harder part is to identify something that does turn out to be a big deal later, but doesn't seem like a big deal at the time. Ideally, something that was not reported in the press at the time, but then shows up in history books. Now, some years ago, the easy version of this was the Watergate story. And so when the, the plumbers, when the Nixon administration's intelligence unit first planted the bugs in the Watergate, that didn't make the news because it was secret. And it was supposed to be secret, and the secret held for a while. And so someone who was reading a newspaper during the week that that happened wouldn't see it. But then, of course, you'd read a history book later, and it's the big story. Okay. So when I'm writing about the period since 1945, I have to deal with those kind of questions. What seemed important at the time? What's really important later? It's with some trepidation that I write about this recent history. I have a much greater comfort level writing about the 1860s than I have writing about the 1960s. It's a lot easier to deal with the late 18th century, about which I've written, than it is the late 20th century. And this, I mean, this might seem a little bit odd, unless You've done it yourself. Because what do we know about the late 18th century? What does our generation, our time, know about the late 18th century? Primarily what historians have been telling us for the last 200 years. So the historians, we historians have all got the story straight. So we can tell you this was important, that was important, that was important, and ignore all the other stuff. Now, we historians ignore all the other stuff. Novelists who write about history, who write historical novels, they have to deal with all that other stuff, which is why their work and their research is so much harder than the research that I do. Because those of us who are in the history business and write nonfiction history, as I say, we sort of agreed on what the outlines of the story are, and then we just interpret from there. But when I'm writing about the period since 1945, it's we don't have this agreement. Yeah, okay, we can agree on the early part. So we know how. World War II led to the Cold War. And we know how the Cold War developed. And we can even get into the 1960s and maybe 1970s. But once past there, it's pretty hard to figure out what's important and what's not. I did an interview for KUT. Some of you may have heard it this morning. And I was asked you know, about the landmark events of the post-1945 period. And how does one identify them, and how does one use them in writing a book? And the first, my short answer was that there's no way of figuring out what the landmark events are. There are events that seem really important at the time. There are events that sort of pull together the collective memory. 
I wrote a book a couple years ago on Franklin Roosevelt. And when I talk to audiences who are old enough to remember, I ask them how many of them can remember where they were when they got the news that Franklin Roosevelt had died. 